I am so excited to announce that iDriver Classic is now sponsored by Adrian Flux, one of the UK's leading classic car insurers. If you're looking for classic car insurance, I've popped a link to Adrian Flux in the description box below. Hi guys, it's Steph from iDriver Classic and today I'm back and we're filming something that we've never done before. We're doing protons, but not one proton, we're doing two protons. We've got this one as well. So this is gonna be a two part video. So this Sunday, you're gonna see this proton and next Sunday, you're gonna see that proton. They're both a 1.5, but they're very, very different. And the best bit of all, they're the only surviving examples. There's only one of these and there's only one of these. So in my eyes, this is probably going to be one of the most exciting iDriver Classic tests. So let's take this one out for a spin. We have never featured a Proton on iDriver Classic before. So before I tell you all about this absolutely gorgeous car and something that's quite special as well, I wanted to tell you a little bit about Proton as a brand because if like me, you don't know too much, I wanted to fill in that gap. So Proton, although massive in Malaysia, are a relatively new to market automotive manufacturer. And they weren't founded until May 1983. The company was founded as Malaysia's first step into automotive. And the name is an acronym of Peruzahan Automobile National, which translates into English as the National Automobile Company. And if you're watching from Malaysia, I apologize profusely if my pronunciation was off there, but don't speak Malaysian. Now, as we'll come to later, the company first started life creating cars, which were essentially rebadged Mitsubishi cars. Although since the year 2000, Proton have actually stepped into the world of non-badged engineered cars, which is really nice because sometimes we talk about automotive brands on here and it almost feels like they've not really stepped forward or they've disappeared. So it's really exciting to talk to you about Proton that have actually not only come from somewhere in the 80s of doing rebadged cars, but are now going from strength to strength. So where did Proton come from? So the concept of Proton was the result of the Malaysian government in 1979, who felt that it was crucial to create a national car to help enhance the Malaysian industry. And in fact, thousands of people today are employed by Proton. So it's a massive employer in Malaysia, and it is also a pretty hefty car brand nowadays. But you may not know that if you're watching from the UK, because we don't actually sell Protons here anymore. But Proton have been so successful for Malaysia and so successful in the automotive industry that Proton and Malaysia have gone from not existing in the early 1980s through to today, where Proton has put Malaysia on the map. And Malaysia is so far on the map that it's one of only 11 countries globally which have full-scale automotive capability. That's massive. So in the last 40 years, Malaysia has not only launched its automotive industry, it's a pretty key player as well. So let's talk about the car we're testing here today because if you've never seen one of these before, I'm not surprised because this is the only one left in existence. And it's the Proton Saga Black Knight Edition. And it's really interesting because the Proton Saga was the car which first put Proton on the map and was the first successful tie-in between Mitsubishi and Proton. So let me tell you a little bit about the Saga. So the Saga is based on the 1983 Lancer Fiore and was the first car, well, was the first of the Protons to be powered by the 1.3 Mitsubishi Orion engine, 4G13. And the Saga was a massive success. And it was such a success, in fact, that Proton couldn't meet the demand. And they sold so well that by 1986, three years after launch, the 1.3 Proton occupied over 60% of the domestic market share 
in the below 1600cc segment. So that's huge. Now the car we're testing today isn't that early 1.3, it's actually a 1.5 and it's powered by the 1.5 Mitsubishi 4G 15 engine. And now when they launched the 1.3 in the Saga, they slightly rejigged the back end as well. So if you've seen a 1.3 before, you'll probably notice the back end of this is slightly different. Now the 1.5 allowed Proton to then enter the UK market because they had a really strong offering. And so with that, they came to the UK and they not only launched the Saga Saloon, they launched the hatchback as well. And it was a generally positive reception because you got a really good car for your money and it was priced really competitively as well. And the UK market loved it so much that Proton then got the accolade of the fastest selling make of new car ever to enter the United Kingdom. But here's where it gets interesting because the Black Knight edition that we're testing today is a UK special edition. So it wasn't available anywhere else. It was only for the UK market. And with only one example remaining, this makes today's test drive something we will never ever be able to replicate. So the Black Knight, as we're testing here today, is based on the ordinary spec Proton Saga 8 valve 1.5 GL and is marked as just a special edition. Although when I did some digging online, I did spot a comment saying it's the aero back with additional extras, but I haven't been able to confirm this. So the special features on the Black Knight are, ironically, the gun metal gray paint. So yes, it's not actually black. The decals on the side and on the boot and the unusual wheel trims, which I am going to put a disclaimer in and tell you that we only put the wheel trims on for the walk around because they are impossible to get because of them only being on 201 cars we can't get any to replace it. So they were only put on for the walk around today. So I hope that's okay for everybody. Now, if you like a fact or two, this is where it gets interesting. So there were only ever 201 of these cars ever made, and this is the only surviving example. And for those of you that like to drill down right into fact, the company who made the spoilers and the decals were called Silver Knight, which may or may not be linked to the name of the vehicle. It's sometimes really hard to clarify smaller details like this when a car is so rare, even at launch, and even rarer today. Now I believe with there being 201, each dealership was only ever given one or two. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about this particular car, which we're testing today. So it was registered in 1989 and then it was garaged in 1993 until the early 2000s, which kind of might explain why it's in such nice condition and it's survived this long. And in fact, it's the earliest Proton left in the UK and was originally sold by New Park Motors in Crewe, which I believe still exists today. Now, there's a lot to show you here today, but before all that, let's meet the owner, John. So this is my Proton 1.5 GL Black Knight. Uh, it is the last of its kind. Uh, there were 201 made and each dealer uh, got one of them uh, as a sort of special edition to sell. And this is the last one out of 201. For some reason, one remains. Um, this is actually my second Proton. I think Steph will be covering another one of mine very shortly. However, uh, today we'll talk about this. It is a 1989 1.5 GL, and it has covered just over 13,000 miles in its lifetime. It's a bog standard model, the GL. Uh, no power steering, no air con, manual windows. However, the Black Knight Edition got you some optional fantastic extras, which were wheel trims, trims down the side, and a spoiler. Yes, special edition. Um, 
that is particularly the difference between the GL uh, and the GL Black Knight. The trims, the wheel trims, uh, which weren't even made by Proton, and, uh, and that's it. Um, so I bought this as a, an addition. I had another one, which is uh, one that you're gonna see as well, which is a 1.5 SE LE. And for some reason, I fell in love with them. I like the rarity of them and the story behind them uh, made me smile. My girlfriend hates them, which is also another motivation behind me putting so much passion into them. Now that we've had a look around the outside and we got a brief peek on the inside, I wanted to talk you through the dash. So if you've ever looked at a mid 1980s Mitsubishi Colt, this probably won't look too dissimilar because well, it's exactly the same. Now for a base spec car, I didn't really have much expectation because for me, when I think of a base spec car and you think of what was Britain really expecting in the 1980s and for this to come in and how does that compete, this offers a lot more. And in my opinion, the plastic and the finish on it as well is far better quality. So of course, we're gonna start over this side and we'll walk you through. So first of all, we are going to look at these door cards. Now you probably have noticed that the finish and the interior on this car is absolutely immaculate. So it's worth mentioning at this point that not only is this the only one left, it's also a premium example because when the current owner bought it, it still had the plastic on the back seats. So Tom, who's filming for me today, is the very first person to ever sit in the back seat of this car. And we didn't even know until he sat down. So we come across from these door cards, which are beautifully unmarked, and we come across to the glove box. Now, one of my biggest complaints of cars is lack of storage, especially in this era. So not only do we have a door pocket, we have a pocket underneath the glove box, we also have a pretty sizable glove box as well that has plenty of room in it. Now, as we come into the center, we almost forget that we're dealing with a base spec because there's a lot of things that are standard on this that I wasn't expecting. Number one is this clock. So it's just a standard quartz clock built in analog. We come through, we've got the heater controls, which I'm gonna test when we're driving because they are so loud. And for me, I think I was actually quite taken aback. They are very loud. Now, as we come down, we've got our cigar lighter there. We've got a rear demist. And again, it's these little bits on this car, which for me really mark it out as being an excellent example of what a base spec really is. We come down to our cassette radio and of course our ashtray. Now, with this being such a beautiful example, it didn't surprise me to see that this ashtray hasn't been used. There's a lot of storage space in this car and it's really, really well laid out. And we've got lots of leg room as well. It's, look, I'll be completely honest. It's really, really surprised me. I didn't know what to expect. I thought it was gonna be pretty average, but so far I'm remarkably impressed with what we get for a base spec model. And then we look down at our controls. Now this is pretty fun. It's a really nice little layout. And over here, we've got our wipers. So we flick up and we've got intermittent. We've got the first speed and the second speed. So again, that's pretty good. I know a lot of you at home sitting and watching thinking, well, my modern car does everything. But back in the 80s, these are the things that really mattered. Now over on this side, we've got our lights. So we're coming to off and side. I really like these controls. They feel quite durable, quite sturdy. And then we have one stalk, which is great. And we've also got our indicators there as well. Now over here, and we're coming to kind of the end of what we've got in here. We've also got the hazard warning lights. And down here, we've got our fog light switch as well. So all in all, it's pretty basic, but we've also got all the fundamentals that we need for a pleasant driving experience. Now, one of the other things that I will point out is because this is a base spec, we have got what some people know as keep fit windows. Look, when there's less electrical stuff, there's less to, less to go wrong. Now, let me show you this gearbox because I've already taken this car for a drive, sorry. And um, one of the things that's really blown me away is what a smooth gearbox it is. Now, I know that we are dealing with a car that's only on around 13,000 miles, but this gearbox is 
in my opinion, on par with some of the modern stuff that I've driven. We've actually got a five speed box on this, which is quite a treat. So when we're coming up into gear, and as I said, it's so smooth. Look, go up to first, down into second, across, up into third, down into fourth, across, up into fifth. And then the nice thing about reverse on this is quite often you've got to lift them. But with this, we just push it all the way along, down, and that takes us into reverse. And then we come back to neutral. We're going to get this car started up, so let's give it a go. It's remarkably quiet actually from inside the cabin, so give it a little rev so you can hear what I'm talking about. Now let's have a listen from the outside. Now, as we drive along, I'm going to take you through the gearbox. So we're setting off in first and the roads around here are pretty rural. So it's going to be probably a little bit of a challenge to get up into fifth, but um, I'm going to try and show you regardless. So as we come up into fifth gear, you're probably thinking to yourself, as I did, wow, this is a car that's really well put together and really well thought out. But guess what? It's not really an accident because the Proton, as we test here today, the 1.5, is sporting a Mitsubishi engine. But that's not where Mitsubishi's influence ends on this car. And in fact, if you've ever seen a Mitsubishi Lancer, think about the 1985 model, this car probably looks very familiar. So it's kind of probably a little bit pertinent now to mention where Proton and Mitsubishi lie. So the Prime Minister of Malaysia said, we need a car of the people, which is roughly what Proton translates as into English. And they came out with the Proton. Now, of course, they recognized, as many good manufacturers have in times before, that they didn't really have the technology to do justice as car of the people. So they went to various manufacturers, and one of the manufacturers they spoke to was Mitsubishi, who said, actually, we're happy to do that. But guess what? We've got a lot of Lancer stuff left. So uh, guess who are going to be doing a Proton that's basically a Lancer? But I've never tested a Lancer before and for me, as someone who's coming into Proton with no expectation, this car is fabulous. It does exactly what it says on the tin. It's not a car which you look at and, well, in today's world, yes, you would look at and you think, wow, I haven't seen one of those in ages. But at the time, it would have really blended into that 1980s going to that 1990s car park. It's not a standout car but as soon as you get behind the wheel you start to see the value in the car now quite interestingly this was very cheap to buy at the time it was seven thousand pounds which was a bit of a double-edged sword because it meant that the car was very popular a lot of people could afford it a lot of people liked them and in fact if you went for the base spec that wasn't the dark knight as we're testing here today i think it was around that six thousand pound mark um which meant that a lot of people could buy into it. It also meant that it came into that same category as your Metro and various other cars that were cheap to buy, like your Micra, and it falls into banger racing, it falls into cheap motoring that people don't look after. And also on top of that, they rotted quite quickly as well, which means that whilst the Proton, as we're testing here today, was a very, very good car, there aren't many left, and in fact, of course, this is the only one of its kind left, which out of 201 is pretty sad because if you think about something like the Minor Million, of which I think there were 
349. There are still so many more of those left, I think one in five, compared to something like this, which was manufactured at the end of the 1980s. So of course I've been telling you that it's lovely to drive. So why is it lovely to drive? Well, so number one, for a budget car, I'm getting a really good driving experience out of it. To say that it's got no power assisted steering, you don't really feel that until you start trying to reverse it or turn it into a parking space, at which point you think, gosh, I wish I'd paid a little bit extra for that power steering because this is a heavy motor to turn around into a space. And, um, it's not, <laughs> it's not the most fun trying to get it into a space when you're having to rack that wheel round. And in fact, it was very, very heavy. Um, but that would probably be my only criticism because as we drive it along, the steering is light enough. It's not so light that you feel like you've got no control over the car and it's not so heavy that it takes away from the driving experience. Now, as we come around this bend, you'll see that the steering is very responsive. I'm barely having to turn the wheel and in fact there is virtually no play in the steering wheel at all compared to a lot of other cars from the 1980s. And with that reliable 1.5 Mitsubishi engine under the bonnet we're not only keeping up with traffic but it's quite a tidy little engine as well which is seen as quite reliable. And if you think about where this was sitting in the market so a budget car that you know everybody could afford this was offering quite a good motor experience. So as I put my foot down, come up into fourth, and then into fifth there as well. Not only is it quite easy to change up through the gears, a lot of gearboxes of this era are sometimes a bit clunky or a bit heavy or, you know, take a bit of guiding in. This one is very, very painless to drive. And it's also quick off the mark as well. It's relatively quiet. I could listen to a cassette as I drive along keeping in with the aesthetic of the era and I wouldn't have to be cranking it right up to drown out noises, knocks and rattles, which is something else I should probably mention because this Proton has absolutely, I don't know if you can hear from the back, but certainly at the front, I can't hear anything knocking, rattling, squeaking, which in the era of the plastic dash is usually commonplace. Now it's always a massive tragedy of, and especially it's usually down to the scrappage scheme that we don't have a lot of stuff like this left. So because of course, round about when that scrappage scheme came in, stuff like this was worth very little. So if something like this had probably needed 100, 200 pounds worth of repairs, it would have just been easier to scrap it and buy something else. But nowadays, there's only one left. So what does that mean in terms of parts? Well, of course, you've got that Mitsubishi connection. So much so that when you take parts off this car, you see the Mitsubishi number stamped on it and also the Proton number stamped over the top as well. So it's been a pleasure taking you out in this Proton today. Um, it's been very different. It was totally not what I expected at all. And uh, it's such a shame that I will never ever get to own something like this because this would be a fantastic hack for going through the motorway. As you can feel, the suspension is well, wow, it's fantastic, you know, we're not clattering down into bumps. It's largely unassuming, so it's not a massive standout car, but by and large, it performs as well as any kind of, to me, up to maybe the early 2000s, in that it does a job and it does it well. And really, it does everything you need a car to do without being too flash, too expensive, or taking a chunk out of your wages every month. So. Very sad that we don't have more of these protons over here, but well, that's what happens when you have a scrappage scheme and everybody is chasing the next best thing. So I really hope you've enjoyed this video today. It's been a pleasure to show you this Proton. And don't forget to check out Driver Classic next Sunday because we will be testing out the next model up. So we get to test out something with maybe a little bit more finesse than no power assisted steering and winding down the windows ourselves. Now until next time, take care and drive safely.